Good morning. Welcome to church this uh, Sunday morning. If you'd like to stand and join with us, we're going to start off by singing Here I Am to Worship. take a seat. Champagne First Church of the Nazarene, good morning. Good morning. How are you all doing today? It is, it is good to see your smiling faces, and I want to say I am glad that each and every one of you are here today, and if you're watching online, I am glad you're watching online as well. I'm glad you're with us. I've got some exciting things to share with us. Um, you may be aware, but on this weekend, we are doing Trunk or treat. We are doing trunk or treat. And the day of, um, I've, got, I've got some notes here. At 3.15, if you have a trunk, that's when um, we're going to start. So if, you, if you're bringing a trunk, come at 3.15. Um, so we are going to be cooking food for trunk or treat. And so if you would like to help cook hamburgers or hot dogs, uh, let us know, and we'll we'll incorporate you into that. 
And we also need people to help out with registration and supervising games. So if you want to help out with registration or supervising games, let us know. And also be on the lookout because we're going to be sending out more information this week about Trunk or Treat. And of course, you're more than welcome to bring candy to any way that you want to help out. We will be grateful for it. Uh, Playpen Sports. Playpen Sports is taking a pause. They're going to be done until January. So Playpen Sports is going to start back up again in January. We're also working on crisis care kits. Um, if you want to help out with that, there's, there's resources that we can assist you with. We're also working on Operation Christmas Child right now. There's boxes in the back with some instructions. So if you want to help out with Operation Christmas Child, you are more than welcome to. And also, Phil has a secret announcement that I don't know anything about. So, okay. Phil, here you are. So, thank you. And just stay right where you are, John, if Pastor David and Joni and Macy would come up. And yeah, Macy, you're close enough after the shower yesterday to be recognized. <laughs> so, so um, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And we are blessed to have not one, but two pastoral families, groupings, whatever you call John and Macy at this point. But um, I wanted to, we uh, wanted to have a card shower and their gifts in here. We are truly, truly blessed to have four amazing people, well, actually six, uh, but we're still getting to know the smallest two. Um, as part of our congregation, and I would just actually, um, I'm going to give each of you uh, the cards that we've kind of got, but it was kind of interesting. We have a general card for both David and John, and I'm not saying that John's military bearing has an over, it comes through, but on David's card, everybody just signed it all over, but on John's card, everybody went right down the line. <laughs> Join me in standing and offering up an applause of love for our pastoral. Thank you all so much. We appreciate you. I got confused. I, I would like to invite the ushers forward as we do our tithes and offerings. As we, as we give and as we share our, our, our tithes and offerings. I, I invite you all to, to pray with me. Lord God, we are grateful for this beautiful day. Lord God, we are grateful for the sunshine. Lord God, we are grateful for the, the changing leaves. We are grateful for the colors that you, you brought into this world. Lord God, we are grateful for the warm breeze. We're grateful for this earth that you've created. And we're grateful for how you have blessed us and all the different ways that you have blessed us. And God, out of our gratitude, let us give our tithes and our offerings to you, Lord God. Let us give back what you have given us first. Lord God, I pray that you bless each gift, Lord God, that you bless each giver, Lord, and may it go to the furtherance of your kingdom. And it's in your name, your son's name, in the name of the spirit that we pray. Amen. If you'd like to stand with us, we're going to continue in worship uh, with the song Blessed Assurance. Taste of glory, dear. 
divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. His goodness lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long.
its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Amen. Amen. Jesus is our living hope. I love, uh, that's one of my favorite songs. We've been, I've been playing it for a little while, and uh, <clears throat> the bridge repeats itself. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe, and out of the silence, the roaring lion declared, the grave has no claim on me. Praise God that we have life abundant. We will be with him in heaven because he was resurrected. Um, I, I, I've never, I say that, I have seen in some old school Nazarene camp meetings people run and wave hankies. That makes me want to run and wave a hanky. Um, but, uh, but I'm, man, praise God that he is our living hope um, and that there is hope for this life, uh, which is a good thing as we continue our, as we conclude our series on reality check. Because sometimes when we take off the rose colored glasses, things can be a little bit feel maybe a little hopeless, feel maybe a little bit scary or worrisome, um, but praise God that there is hope. Uh, so we, we are this morning <coughs> finishing our Reality Check series, um, and uh, before we do that, I just want to say thank you so much for the, the wonderful love that you gave us, um, for John and Macy and for Joni and I. Uh, it has been a blessing over the last six months to be your pastor, um, and I believe God is doing things, and you will hear more about that hope in the message um, but I want to encourage you, we still have another week left in Pastor's Appreciation Month. And I said this the other, th no, this is not for me. Um, I said this the other week, find a pastor on our district, on another district, multiple pastors, find their contact info, send them an encouraging note. Pray for them. I, I, I dare you. <laughs> I dare you to download the list of churches on our district and the pastor's names and put them on your prayer list every week. Because the reality is God is moving there and we are part of one body, even the pastors in this area. I've had the privilege of getting to know people, uh, Pastor Randy over at Windsor Road, um, Pastor Herb over at Mattis Avenue Free, uh, Free Methodist. You know, these are people that we are, we are laboring with. We talked about it last week. Contact them. Say, hey, I just want you to know I'm praying for you, and I appreciate you. I appreciate you serving the Lord and what God's doing to you. Appreciate pastors, not just me and John. We appreciate it so much, but let's extend that uh, beyond our four walls. Uh, but... Uh, this morning, we will uh, continue and conclude our Reality Check series. We started out by sharing, taking off our rose-colored glasses, and sharing the fact that our world really isn't as united as what some may think. The, the outlook of, of how our world is maybe isn't really as hopeful as what some people perceive. We are divided as a country. We're divided as a culture. We're divided um, gen <laughs> boomers. And Gen Z, I mean, you know, like there, there's so much division. And even in the church, we're divided. But there's hope because God tells us, so as it pertains to you, as much as it is you, in your power, live at peace with one another. Do everything to be united. We are one body, many members. And if that is God's desire, God's going to work to make that happen. 
We're called to be united, not divided. And then last week we looked at the fact that the harvest is massive around us. It's so big. We talked about the 4.7 million people in the state of Illinois that don't know Jesus. We talked about the, the 80 plus thousand people that would fill Memorial Stadium and the State Farm Center and probably the parking lots where Tommy and Tyler work, they'd be full and everything would be full of people who don't yet know Jesus. The harvest is massive. And individually working can seem so daunting that we just never will get it done. But together, Jesus says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest field, that the harvest would come. Together, things get done. We are those laborers. There is no retirement. There is no, I've done my time. I've done, you know, I was talking to another uh, a district leader earlier this week, and I mentioned that, and he went, wow, that's bold. <laughs> it's like, I don't, you know, it's true, though. You know, there is no retirement. There is no hey, I've done my time. There's always another place to serve. There's always another place to re-enlist, and God wants to use you. Um, in fact, side note, I was telling Joni, thank you so much for all the blessings you gave to Joni and I for Madeline, uh, Madeline, and, Mor- wow. Madeline and Morgan. Um, but there were some really cool crochet things. Joni started a crochet. Susie Williams' wife um, that I lived with, uh, she's second, third mom. Um, she crochets. And I thought to myself, I'm like, wow, you know, I just preached a sermon on how to labor, and some people can't do physical labor and whatnot. And I'm like, how cool would it be if we got some people together and crocheted uh, hats and blankets and stuff for, for babies at the hospital? I don't, I don't know what God is calling you to do in your laboring, but God wants us to work. And so the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. We need to, we need to work. And this morning as we finish, um, this is probably, you can tune, tune out now, because this morning the sermon is for me. Uh, this is something that God has been preaching to me for the last few months. This is for David. If it, if it hits you, great. But this is for David. I want you to know this is for me. And, um, but, but this morning as we finish, our last reality check is that the journey that we're on, both individually and corporately, as the body of Christ, is a marathon, not a sprint. It's a marathon, not a sprint. This is not a, this is not a 60 meter hurdles, 60 meter dash. This is a a marathon, not a sprint. So if you, are, if you have your Bible with you, and you will join with me as we open uh, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, um, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2, uh, and uh, if you would stand, if you can, uh, for the reverence of, reading, of the reading of God's Word this morning, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, therefore, anytime there's a therefore in Scripture, it's there for a reason, you got to figure out why. Um, <laughs> so, so, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, to live this life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that you make it possible for us to run this race with endurance. God, you don't leave us out to dry and just say, hey, go, hope you, hope you make it. God, you, um, you, you prepare us and you help us to do this. And you put a great cloud of witnesses around us, um, not just to view us, but to encourage us, to cheer us on, to, to spur us on as we run. You, you put other runners in the race that we would run together. We're not alone in it. God, that, that we would be able to run this marathon together to do what it is that you want to do. And I pray this morning that you would offer hope and encouragement and challenge uh, that would help us to run well and to trust you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Run with endurance. Wow. Um, <clears throat> if, the <laughs> um, if, if the journey wasn't long, I don't think that the writer of Hebrews would have used that word. If the journey wasn't arduous, if he didn't know that the journey that Jesus had, us, that God has us on, was long and, and arduous, I don't think he would have used that. He would have used language that said, run with explosiveness, run with power, run with speed, run with strength, use quick movements, right? Those would have been the words that he would have used because if you watch the Olympics or if you're a sports junkie and you just happen to watch college track and field or um, the Diamond League or whatever, those, those are the words that are used to describe 100-meter sprinters or 110-meter or, um, hurdlers or 60-meter sprinters. Quick, fast, speed, and, uh, explosiveness, power out of the blocks, things like that. But he didn't use those words. He used the word endurance because the writer of Hebrews understood 
that this journey that we are on is not one that is short. It is long. It's longer than we probably imagine. It's longer than our mind can fathom. It's more than what we understand. And so he used that word specifically. What are some things that take endurance? Now, John, you guys may know, is a runner. Um, and, and John was actually going to run a marathon last week, but logistics didn't work out. Um, and so, but, uh, but if, you're, if you're around any time during the day, you can kind of see him running, in so, sometimes in bright colored shorts, um, out here on, on uh, Kirby and kind of around. Um, he's a runner. And, and he's also a marathon finisher. 26.2 miles is a long way. Like, if you have any questions about that, if you have any questions about that, get out here on, on, on 72, take off west, <clears throat> you'll pass Monticello, and then you'll hit 26 miles. Yeah, that way, sorry. <laughs> east, west. <laughs> Go that way. Um, and you'll pass Monticello. And then... Just before you get to Decatur, you'll hit 26 miles. It's a long way, especially when you're running. <clears throat> it takes quite a bit of endurance. If any of you are cyclists, there's, there's what is known as a century ride. Now, obviously, that's pretty self-explanatory. Century is 100, so it's a 100-mile bike ride. 100 miles on a bike is a long way. <laughs> um, most of the time, it takes a cyclist somewhere in the neighborhood. Well, if you're really, really fast, or if you're a professional, like three and a half hours, four hours. But mo the average person in the neighborhood of six to six and a half hours to ride 100 miles. Six and a half hours on a bike. Like, that's a long way. That, that takes so much endurance. It's a test of endurance. If you're a swimmer like I am, um, I was looking at some open water swim things. There's, there's one, um, and I really want to do it. It's so awesome. There's, uh, you, you actually swim from Alcatraz back to San Francisco Beach, and, and uh, I, I really want to do that at some point. Uh, but I found one the other day that's closer to home. Used to vacation there when I was a kid. It's an 8.2-mile swim around Mackinac Island. Um, 8.2, that's, that is so beyond me. I've never swam 8.2 miles. Um, so I'm kind of crazy to even consider it. But all of those things take endurance. They take effort. They're long events, hours and hours. If there's any topic this morning that I feel equipped to speak on, it's, it's endurance. All of those events are major endurance tests. Some I've done, some I've not yet, some I may never do. But however, I am, I am a two-time finisher of one of the world's toughest endurance events. It's called the Ironman Triathlon. And an Ironman Triathlon consists of a 2.4-mile open water swim. You get out, you put on your bike shoes, you jump on your bike, and you ride 112 miles on a bike, you jump off your bike, you put your running shoes on, and you run 26.2 miles after that. Now, for those of you who are really good at math, that equals 140.6 miles. Sometimes a little further if you veer off course on the swim or something like that. But, but it's 140.6 miles. Three different disciplines that take between 10 and 12 hours, well, 7.5 for professionals. The average person between 10 and 13, even up to 17 hours to complete. 17 hours of human-propelled locomotion. That's endurance. And I, twice I've done it. I know you guys are thinking, dear Lord, we hired a crazy person to be our pastor. What, are we, what were we thinking? This guy's a nut job. <clears throat> the journey that we're running is not a 200 or 400 meter run. It's an Ironman and even more. This, this journey that we're on is, is beyond an Ironman. There are some people that I know that do double Ironmans and stuff like that. They, they are the crazy people. Um, ultra marathoners, 100-mile runners, those are crazy people. But even that does not clarify the endurance that it requires for us to run this. And I think, I think the, the, the thing we need to remember, the long, arduous journey, as we, as we look at this, you know, it says um, in Scripture that, that there's this prize at the end. There's this heavenward prize, our finish line, the eternity with the Father is there, and it gives us hope as we run. But I think we have to run eyes wide open when we do it. You know, because if we don't, if we don't have our blinders off, if we don't have this reality check of the, the endurance that it requires for us to run, then we're at risk of tiring out or burning out or, or quitting earlier or just, <clears throat> you know, not, not finishing well. And Scripture tells us to finish well. There's an interesting thing about all first-time Ironman competitors, or most of them at least, and William, when he comes to dedicate Maddie or, or whenever they come, you can, you can ask him about this. Totally, he can attest to it. Um, getting off the bike, getting onto the run. There is a point in time in an Ironman when the first-time competitor goes, 
oh, Lord, what have I done? Oh, my gosh, I have how much longer to go? <laughs> oh. Um, there's this eyes wide open reality check moment in an Iron Man that just everybody is like, why did I sign up for this? This is crazy. And so for us, <clears throat> if we can have our eyes wide open beforehand, if we can understand, <clears throat> excuse me, we can understand beforehand the journey that we're on, the endurance that it requires, the things that are going to come up, it'll help us to run better with endurance. It'll help us to understand the length that is required for us as we serve the Lord. It's not a quick sprint. It's not, it's not, a, it's not anything um, that's going to happen fast. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the other thing, so, so we understand that the race is long. We get it. It's long. It's so long. For some, it's really, really, really long. Longer than we ever could complete. But by God's grace, we get there. It runs with endurance. But here's the other thing. The race is not easy. It's tough. It's not just long. It's difficult. It's tough. There are obstacles and trials and things that happen along the way that are there to possibly cause us to to trip up and stumble. There are things that are going to maybe derail us or, or veer us off course. We have to understand, eyes wide open, early, that the race is not easy, that it's tough. Training and perseverance are incredibly important to doing an endurance event. If I told you right now, hey, we're going to go out and run a marathon, not only would you probably not complete it, but your body would hate you for months afterwards because training and perseverance are important. When I was training for my Ironman, the the very first time, um, and I'm actually – some don't know. I'm actually beginning the process again with the hopes of racing here in a few years. I know. I'm crazy. I get it. Um, but there is something just I, I love about it. I'm a glutton for punishment. But when I was training, I trained as hard as I could. I trained in as many different ways that I could to try and prepare myself for what was ahead, for what I thought was ahead, for what I thought was going to come at me on race day. Because trials happen. You know, whether it's on, on, on an Ironman, whether it's a flat tire on a, on a marathon, whether you're, you start cramping, you have, you have, you know, stomach issues, things, things happen. And in life, in this life, in this endurance race that we are running, trials will happen. Financial hardships, sickness, death, things that come will happen. And in those moments, it's the possibility of derailing us completely. And our hope is lost and we go, God, what happened? I don't understand. Why is this here? Or we have the choice to persevere. And and those trials, when we push through, God shows up. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4 says, we can rejoice. Wow, that's a strange thought process. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. How many of us, that's our first instinct? Thank you, Jesus, that this happened. Thank you, Jesus, that my car broke down and now I get to pay $2,500 for it. Thank you, Jesus, that I lost my job. Thank you, Jesus, for this sickness or whatever, this ailment. I don't think when Joni got her diagnosis of diabetes, she's like, praise God, this is awesome. I don't think that's our instinctual response when trials come. We can rejoice when trials and problems come, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Trials help us develop endurance endurance. And endurance develops a strength of character. Did you know that the more endurance you have in this life, the more your character reflects Christ? The more people see your character in those trial situations? Because you know what? I've been here before. God's gonna, God's here with me. I'm not alone. Our character shows up. Endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And that hope never leads to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Trials produce endurance, endurance character, and character strengthens our hope that says, you know what, it doesn't matter what comes before me because my God loves me and he's going to be there with me and I don't know how we're going to get through it, but we're going to get through it. That is endurance. James chapter 1 verses 2 and 4 says, Dear brothers and sisters, I love when people write and talk about that because it just feels so close. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity of great joy. These people who were writing these letters faced far worse persecution than we face in this life. And they were at risk of death. Consider it joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. 
So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Trials give our endurance a chance to grow. As we push through, as Christ helps us through these moments, we become more like him, we rely more on him, and we become more complete. These two passages that teach us about endurance, they help us know that with God's help, we can do more than we ever thought we could. If you'd have told me 20 years ago, that would make me 16, I was in high school, that I, would, that I would have completed an Ironman, let alone a marathon, I would have called you a liar and probably some other things. Because in that moment, I, ra- I ran track, I played football, I played baseball, I did all these things in high school. I hated running a 200 meters. My coach, like, when we would get in trouble, I would get put in the 400 meters, and I hated him for it. Because 400 meters is a long, that's only one lap around the track, but it's a long way. I was a sprinter. I was a 100 meter, 110 meter hurdle, long jumper pole vaulter. I, I did not run any more than I had to. I despised running. We would run for football, and I'm like, no, I hate this. Like, I only have to go four to six seconds. Why am I running, you know, 115-meter sprints over and over and over again? This is crazy. I hated running. 20 years later, I actually enjoy it. It's a God thing. <clears throat> Endurance produces character. Character, hope. Hope doesn't disappoint. Endurance helps us to grow. God is taking you on a journey. Training and trials help build you that. Through training and through the process of, of, of training for Iron Man, God equipped me to run 26.2 miles. The journey that we are on, in our own doing, we're not ready for. We're the David that was in high school hating 200 meters. But by God's grace and his equipping, we can run 26.2 miles. We can run more than 26.2 miles. We can do what it is that God is calling us to do, the journey that he's got us on. But here's the thing, sometimes, sometimes things come up that we're not prepared for. For any of you that have run, and John, you can ask John after service, there's a thing roughly 18 to 20 miles into a marathon known as the wall. If you've ever been, if you've ever been to a marathon, sometimes the people that run that aid station in that area actually will build a cardboard wall with a hole in it so you can run through the wall. But there is, I, I've seen it, I've been a part of it, but there is a wall that you hit where your body really just starts to break down, and mentally you get to a point where you're like, why am I doing this? This is Why did I convince myself to run 26.2 miles? But the thing is, even if you know it's coming, and marathon runners know it's coming, it still hits you like a ton of bricks. It still gets you, even though we've trained and prepared, maybe you've run more than 20 miles before, it will still come up and bite you because things come up. For me... <laughs> It was my first Ironman in Lake Placid, New York. Now, if you know where Lake Placid is, it's in the Adirondack Mountains in northern, northern New York. Um, they are called the Adirondack Mountains because that is exactly what they are. I was living in Alabama at the time. Uh, there's a cool website called Slow Twitch. It's a blog for all other crazy endurance athletes. And I had logged on there, and I'm like, I need to know what the race profile is because I'm living in Alabama, not in mountains. I need to understand what I'm getting into. And so somebody had posted on there, oh, there's only 4,500 feet of climbing on the bike. Like, that's a lot. So I trained for 4,500 feet of climbing on the bike. Did long rides, 80-mile rides, 100-mile rides, you know, training, climbing, long climbs, steep climbs, all these things. There were 7,500 feet of climbing on the bike, and I missed it by 3,000 feet. Um, and that was, a, uh, that, was a, that was a moment for David. Because it's a two-loop course, and I finished one loop, and I'm going, uh-oh, I got another one of these to go. And, and you climb out of Lake Placid, and you go down this seven-mile descent, and then there's about 18 miles of flat, and then you literally, the last 18 miles of the, the loop, you r- climb slowly back into Lake Placid, New York. And, I, and I'm telling you this, and this is, I, I joke about it, it's so terrible. On that last climb in, like tears streaming down my face because I was hurting, and mentally I was struggling, and I wanted to quit, and the only thing that kept me going um, was as I was taking pedal stroke after pedal stroke, in Christ alone, my, I'm not even, not even joking, I had to do that to keep a tempo and to keep myself going and to keep going because something had come up and kicked me in the teeth that I wasn't prepared for, and only Jesus was the one who got me through it. But the thing that I learned when I finished that 112-mile bike was, wow, I can climb 7,500 feet on a bike. Never done that before. That, that endurance 
that God brought me through proved that I could go farther than I could. It proved that I could endure the trials that were in front of me. And now I understand that next time I go out and race that, I can do it. I can go further than I thought I could. There are things in this life that are guaranteed. One of those is trials. Things are going to come up. Death is, there are only two things in life that are guaranteed, death and taxes. It's going to come. Trials will come. Sickness. Things will come up. But God will equip you to be able to do it. He will put people around you. I cannot tell you how many people were suffering on that climb coming back. I mean, I was, I, man, we were all struggling. And, 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 you know, going by people and saying to people, you know, you're doing a great job. Or having people look at you and say you're doing a great job. Or the people on the side of the road that lived in, in these small towns in the Adirondacks. They would be out there and they're going, you are doing awesome. You've only got a few miles to go. You're doing great. We'll help you to carry through. It will help you to grow and to, and to go and to, to, to finish what you started. It will push you beyond what you think. And here's the thing. When our, induces, when our endurance produces character and the character hope, that's contagious. That's contagious. When, when my hope is overflowing going, you know what? It's all good because God's in it. God's doing things. He's moving. He's working. We're going to make it. When you're running that marathon and everybody's suffering at mile 20 and you're looking at each other going, you know what? There's only six miles to go. We can do this. It's a 10K. We've all been there before. We can do this together. Come on, one step in front of the other. That's what this Christian life is about. That's where God equips us together corporately to be able to move and to work. The race is long, and the race is tough, and those are truths. But you know what? The finish is there. So we need to keep running because God's working, and it's worth it. God is moving, God is working, and it is worth it. The best part of an Iron Man, the best part of an Iron Man is the finish because you're done. No, like, no, just kidding. It's, it, is, it is somewhat the best because you're done. But the best part of finishing is knowing that you completed what you set out to do. When we accept Christ, we, we jump on this journey. And this journey is to not just finish and get to heaven. This journey is to, to win people for the kingdom, to share the love of Jesus, to share the grace of the salvation of Jesus Christ with as many people as we can. You know, and, 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 and help them to understand the life and the joy and the hope and the grace that Jesus talks about in John 10.10 for here on earth that we can run together, that we would work together in the harvest field, that people would come to know him. That is our journey. And the best part is finishing and hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. When we labor and run this race, God in his timing will bring completion to the race. We don't know when it's going to happen. We're not guaranteed today. I don't know when my race is going to be over. But I know that at some point in time, I will cross that finish line. And when I do, I want God to say, you know what? You did so well. You ran with endurance. Your character was great. Your hope was there. You you brought people with you. You encouraged others along the way to join you. You were part of what I was doing. It helps us to labor with others. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, let us not get tired in doing what is good. At the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. God is moving and he is working. He's behind the scenes. He's doing things and we've just got to keep working. I have to constantly remind myself as a pastor. I'm in, I'm in, I'm, I'm, I call myself a zenial. It's kind of a new generational term. I'm part Gen X, part millennial, and the millennial part of me is an instant gratification guy. I grew up in the instant gratification society. Things at your fingertips, internet, everything. And I have to remind myself that you don't turn a cruise ship on a dime or an aircraft carrier, for those of you that are in the Navy. Rome wasn't built in a day. Neither was the the walls of Jerusalem weren't rebuilt in a day, Nehemiah. Things don't happen quickly. You don't finish an Iron Man 50 minutes after you start. 14 hours once, 13 hours the second time. It doesn't come quick. I believe and I know that God is doing things here at Champaign First Church. He is moving and he is working. And and it may seem a struggle at times when, you know, we have playpen outside and we're meeting people in the community and we're making making connections. 
And everybody and their brother's not just pouring in the doors to come hear David preach. I'm not that good of a preacher. You know, the things, but, but that can be discouraging. Oh, well, all these things are happening. Why is nothing coming of it? We're doing all these things. We're doing trunk or treat, but, but none of the people at trunk or treat are coming to church the next Sunday. Why did we do it? It's an endurance test. Playpen sports, meeting people in the community, building relationships. You're six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years maybe before you see the harvest. Maybe three years to five years. You never know. But God is working here at Champaign First. Illinois District Nazarene. Champaign Churches, the body of Christ here, the U.S., the world. He is moving and he's working. And it says, let us not grow tired of doing good. Let's not grow weary because in his timing, the harvest will come. We will reap a blessing if we don't give up. Earlier I said that this was for me. Over and over and over again for the last five months, I've had to remind myself of this. To keep running, to keep praying, to endure hardship, to endure trials, Because God is moving and he's working. And in his timing, things will happen. I want to encourage you. God is moving. He's working. Let's not lose hope. Let's not lose heart because he's moving and he's working. And in his time, things will happen. Lives will be transformed. I'm believing wholeheartedly. We're going to make the announcement um, coming up. Sneak peek. We're putting on the calendar once a quarter baptisms. Because I believe that if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. But if we have that up there and we're praying and we're preparing and we're believing God, I believe that in time we'll have one and then three and then five and then ten and then twenty people being baptized in our baptistry. Professing Christ and their their love for him and their life with him. In time, God will bring a harvest. So I said earlier that the best part of an Ironman is the finish, jokingly, but really and truly it is. It's the finish. No matter what time you finish, and I hope someday um, one of the cool things that that happens at an Ironman, this is a side note, um, especially Lake Placid is Lake Placid Baptist Church brings in mission teams to serve. There's a prayer tent beforehand. People serve on race day literally from like 5 o'clock in the morning until midnight. People are out serving. And it's a great opportunity to share the love of Jesus with people who really don't lack anything in this world except Jesus. Um, and it's, been, it's an awesome time, and I hope at some point in time to take a mission team up there. I'll let you guys see it. But the coolest part of an Ironman is the finish line. Because it doesn't matter whether you finish at seven and a half hours as a professional or 17 hours with the clock ticking down. There are gobs and hordes of people packed into this finish line. And there's these plastic um, advertisements on this railing and people are banging them and people are cheering and people are going crazy cheering people into this finish line and at the end there was a guy named Mike Riley he's now retired but there's a person who who calls your name and says David Hader you are an Iron Man as you cross the finish line it is literally the most chilling experience I've experienced on on this earth it is but it's bananas because you hear this crowd just roaring cheering you and encouraging you. This passage says we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. So let us run with endurance. That great cloud of witnesses is cheering you on, saying, you know what, you're there, you can do it, keep going. Whether you're five miles in or whether you're finishing in the the finish shoot, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And as we finish, as we do it, those cheering us on, and, and, and God waiting to say, well done. Here is which you have prayed for. Maybe it's not the well done, my good and faithful servant. Maybe it's you've prayed for the harvest. And here's that which you've prayed for. Well done. Good job. Keep running. Keep moving. Keep working. Don't stop. Don't stop. Now the thing is, there's a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. There are people all around us. But you are part of that crowd. So my hope and my prayer is that as we run, and as we see others run, that we would cheer people on. Don't grow weary. Keep going. Keep working. Keep praying. God's moving. Believe Him for what He is doing. He's the one who who makes us be able to run 140.6 miles. It's not David. It's It's not John completing a marathon. It's God. 
I, 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 lit- I mean, if, and if you want to hear down the road, I could tell you story after story after story after story of individual moments in those races where God showed up at just the right time, where I needed an encouragement and someone went, here you go, David. Here's, here's that which you've prayed for. Keep going. In this journey of 36 years, 18 years of of walking with Jesus, there have been so many times in my life where I've I've prayed and I've needed somebody to break through in a trial, and God says, here you go, David. Here's that which you've prayed for. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. You're, You're not done yet. The finish line is there. You can hear it. Keep going. I'm moving. I'm working. That's our journey. That's our endurance. The reality check is this. This life is not a sprint. Don't don't burn all your candles right away. Endure. Keep going and keep working. The journey's long. I know I'm younger than some of y'all. I've been walking with Jesus for less long than some of y'all. Some of you guys are much farther along on that loop, maybe in your second or third or fourth loop. And you can encourage me by saying, you know what? Keep going. Keep going. You're doing great. Keep going. But I can encourage you in the same way and say, you know what? You've done so much already. Keep going. You're doing fantastic. Thank you for letting me stand on your shoulders. Keep going. Keep working. Your journey's long. It's tough. Psalm 23 says, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God does not lead us into, he leads us out of that valley. And God wants to use us to help each other out of that. Trials are going to come. I promise you. I've been been your pastor for six months, and I've already had two funerals. That's, that's, not an, that's not an average thing for a first-time pastor. Trials come. Death, illness, financial hardship, life hardship. I was just, you know, share, someone was just sharing with me before service about somebody they know that's dealing with marital issues and possible divorce and stuff. Life happens. Trials come. Endure through it. God wants to use you and me to help others endure through it. He's going to put us in situations to walk with people and to be with people in their trials so that they too can endure. Life is not easy. God doesn't promise it will be, but he promises to be with us in it so that we can endure, so that our our perseverance produces character and our character hope. And the last thing is, no matter where you are, no matter how far along you are, keep running. Keep running. Don't stop. Don't stop now. Don't quit. Don't get tired. If you're tired, keep going. They they do this thing called a trot, like when you get really, really tired, but like you don't want to stop and you don't want to walk. Keep moving. Keep moving forward. God is, the the things that you have prayed for, God is working on, and in his timing, we will see that harvest. I believe that wholeheartedly, and and I'm, I'm praying for you, that you individually, that us as a corporate body, that the body of Christ here in Champaign, that the, the Christians of the world would endure and keep running because God is moving and the harvest is coming and, and, and I believe that wholeheartedly. Life's a marathon, not a sprint. Let's keep moving. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you that, that you promised to never leave us or forsake us. God, that you promised to be there. God, you, you say that, that, that we should take heart. We should have courage. We should stand firm. God, all those, all those words are, are words of strength. And God, sometimes in this life, we don't feel very strong. We feel weak. We feel tired. We, we, we feel like we just can't take another step because this journey is long and it's hard and trials come. But God, I pray that you would, in those moments, give us an extra dose of energy. God, that you would put somebody in our life to say, you know what, you're doing awesome. Keep going. Let me run with you for a little while. Let me be with you for a little while. God, maybe you would use us to be that person for somebody else, to, to in, the, in the middle of a marathon, as we're suffering and they're suffering, to walk along and say, you know what, let's do this thing together for a little while. Let's journey together for a little while. Let's keep moving. God, I pray that you would just, with, with all the people who are here in person, all those that are watching online, God, that you would encourage us to endure, that our character would grow God, that the hope of Jesus through th- of salvation and, and life abundant here on earth would just persevere and grow and become contagious, that everybody around us would want to be a part of what we're doing. God, the people who feel hopeless and helpless, that they feel like they just can't take another step, God, would you put us in their lives to be able to offer hope and endurance for people? To say, you know what? Your journey's not done. And I know a God that'll help you through it. 
God, would you just help us to be your hands and feet, to have endurance, to push through and persevere. God, that the kingdom would be filled with as many people as possible. God, that we would reap the harvest that we've prayed for. God, we pray right now for everybody that's been involved in Playpen. God, the people in this neighborhood. God, the people in this community that don't yet know you or maybe have walked away because of hurt or heartache or some reason. God, we pray for them. I pray that right now in this moment you would reach down and you would be present with them. God, that they would feel something radically different in their life right now, that you would begin the process of beginning that. And God, whether it takes six months or 12 months or two years or five years, God, that you would reap a harvest for the kingdom in that. God, help us to be a part of it. God, we trust you. Help us to run long. Help us to train hard, to be prepared. God, to endure trials. And no matter what happens, God, help us to keep running. Because in your timing, you'll, we'll reap a harvest. And uh, God, we trust you for that. Would you bless us and keep us today? God, help us to do what it is that you want us to do this week. And may the kingdom grow exponentially and lives be transformed. And we'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'm so glad you were here this week and with us this morning. Um, don't forget, sign up sheet for uh, Trunk or Treat. If you want to help cook, that was a change of plans. Um, we need some help cooking uh, ha- hot dogs and hamburgers. And you do not want Pastor David doing it because I don't grill well. Um, but we need help with that. We need some help with registration and some uh, running games for those of you who don't feel like you can do a trunk. Um, we need candy uh, and, and just a lot of help. Please be praying that God would bring the people he wants here on that week for a safe space to, to have candy and a great time and that, that they would experience Christ um, and a loving family in that moment when they're here this weekend. <clears throat> also, um, Christ's care kits are in the, the, the Ziplocs are out there of what you need to bring. And uh, Operation Christmas Child, thank you so much for Pastor's Appreciation. Uh, go and find another pastor to encourage and appreciate and love on. And uh, be part of that great cloud of witnesses that says, you know what? You're doing awesome. Keep going. Endure. And uh, we'll believe God for what he wants to do. Well, would you stand and receive this blessing as we leave? Um, and uh, trust God for it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. God, would you just shine your grace and your love and your mercy down on these people? Would he turn his face towards you just as an attentive father does? And may he give you peace for this week. Lord bless you. You're dismissed.